just a little bit, and, and it's so amazing because I can, I can read you what we have here. Former U.S. Congressman Bob McEwen has served our nation as United States Representative, elected six terms, that's awesome, and was a special presidential envoy for two U.S. presidents. He was elected to the U.S. Congress Select Committee on Intelligence, which oversees all national secrets. By the way, there's only uh, four of those in the Republican Party that's nominated to that. And when that took place, by the way, you're nominated by your peers, and two names were uh, put forward for that particular uh, position at the, at the same time, and both these gentlemen uh, received that position, took that position of, uh, of one on the Intelligence Committee, and that was Congressman Bob McEwen and Dick Cheney. So we're in great company and wise company tonight, brilliant company tonight. He is going to be leaving shortly this week, right after this conference. He's going to be heading off to the Balkans to meet with three prime ministers there. He was also a member of the very coveted and also elected by your peers Congressional Rules Committee. And in that position that he had, there's four that have that position. In that position, no matter how senior the other congressional members are, they've got to come and ask you for an opportunity to speak or duration to speak. And it's a very, very powerful position. And God has blessed Congressman McEwen with that in his service to our country. He has a remarkable, keen, as you learned last night, way of unpacking difficult things and making them simple. That's a gift. Dr. J. Vernon McGee, you ever listen to the... the amazing, huh? Dr. J. Vernon McGee had a, a wonderful way of taking the cookies, as they say, off the shelf and putting them on the table. And you'll see once again tonight that Congressman McEwen has that incredible gift. Um... We will have, at his request, we will have a time, we think, pretty sure, going to, if we go to schedule, we will have a time of questions and answers. Uh, but listen, those questions will be somewhat regulated or monitored for duration. No one will be allowed to preach their own message. You have to have a question. <laughs> and uh, if you want to pulpit, go somewhere else. But uh, microphones will be available for you. Uh, ushers will be uh, having those later. Um, let the questions, please. In fact, we'll make sure that the questions apply to the evening. Okay, that's very, very important. So I'm going to get out of the way. Give a warm welcome to Congressman Bob McEwen this evening. Well, <clears throat> thank you very much. Thank you, Jack, and thank all of you for this gracious invitation and opportunity to be with you. It's been a real pleasure to to be with all of these important folk that you've had here this weekend and just to be with, this, with you all in this church. This is a special, special place. If I lived within 100 miles of this church, this is where I would go to church. So, uh, <clears throat> so what we want to do is try to just put a little ribbon around some of the things that we've tried to learn in the last few weeks, or the last few hours, rather. And um, you know, my sister when she was about five or six, developed this fear that we were going to run out of gas. And she would constantly be afraid we're going to run out of gas, going to run out of gas. And so finally, my father one day took her to the filling station and showed her the gas gauge and then put gas in it, showed what happened to the gas gauge, and then did a little bit more and a little bit more until it was completely full. And then on the way home, he asked her, he said, have I ever run out of gas? No. You understand that if we're going to run out of gas, this gauge here will tell us and so we'll know. And from then on, she was at peace. She never worried about running, because she didn't know what caused it. Well, when we speak about prophecy, prophecy is like a, a gas gauge. It tells us what's happening. And when you see these things begin to come to pass. And so it'd be appropriate if we took a few of them just to say that God said, when this happens, then this is going to happen. When this happens, that's going to happen. And what I want to do is just to grab three or four of them very quickly, and then we'll go to questions thereafter. And the reason that we do that is just to try to remind us something we confess, but we need to know, that God is in control, Amen. that God knows us, that he made us, and that in the midst of things that 
what's happening at this moment might not make sense. Most of you are fortunate enough to not know or had an experience with a thing called polio. It was fortunately done away with some time ago. But some will remember. One Sunday at our home, everything was fine. <clears throat> and on Thursday, my brother died of polio. He was two years older than I was. But then on Saturday, my mother died of polio. And the next week, my father had a double funeral with seven children lined up on the front pew with him. And he was alone. Now, the question would be, in the midst of that, how could this make sense? And so what I'm going to do is take a couple of examples of how this works. And we're going to use as our explanation the Bible. Now, the Bible, uh, when, when I was in school, we had to, in college, I had to take this thing called Introduction to Philosophy. And, and anybody who knows my temperament, Contemplating your navel is just the last thing that I like to do. <clears throat> now, some people love it. My friend Chuck Colson just, just loves, he loves philosophy. And to me, it's just... And, <clears throat> and so but we had to study three different philosophers every class. We had three classes a week. And then at the end, we, would, we, we had a, a test. And, um, and so we had the exam, and we did it. And I thought we were going to go back to class the last time to pick up our grades. And so I was studying for the next exam for the course that would be next. I was sitting in the back of the room, clear in the corner. There's a back door by there. And so rather than just giving us our grades and letting us go, the professor said, well, now that you've studied all these different philosophies, uh, I want you to describe which philosophy you best identify with. And you identify a philosophy by your concept of God and the purpose of man. And so they went through, started the front row, and started to go through. And after about the fourth or fifth person, it became abundantly clear that no two people were going to say the same thing. And he said, well, I agree with so-and-so. And they said, God is trees, and man is this, and born, and whatever. And, and they just, everybody had each little nuance, and no two were alike. And I had other things to do. So my thoughts were elsewhere. And finally, they get back to me and said, Bob, well, what's your philosophy? I said, oh, yeah, concept of God. Okay, I believe that man is a creation who is made in the likeness and image of God, who is the creator and the sustainer of the universe. And so then I look back down to my book, and suddenly the class just erupted. I mean, just everybody whipped around in their chair, and they're all talking out loud, and they're attacking my philosophy. And, and, and I thought, this is like candid camera. Somebody's going to come in and pull the whistle. I mean, this is crazy. I started giggling, just like you are. I thought, this, this, this is crazy. It's like I poured gasoline on the floor or something. I mean, everybody are all upset. And, and so I was with my brothers a few days later, and I told them, what had happened, and how everybody was offended at my philosophy, and yet they just had 35 of them, and nobody was offended at all. And I said, how did, how did they know that what I said was truth? Why were they only offended at that? 